I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to work with kids like this because uh, you're really pushing forward the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode three of the Jimmy and Kyle show. This week, we've got three special guests with us, all former Seattle United players. We've got Katie Mockett, current Washington University in St. Louis player and academic All-American. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we've got Ethan Air, who is current Sounders Academy player, Tacoma Defiance player, and U-17 national team player. Just got back from the World Cup this fall. Ethan, how are you doing? Good, how are you, Kyle? Good, man. And then last but not least is Mr. Paul Rothrock. He is now a national champion from Georgetown University and former Seattle United player and Sounders player as well. Paulie, how are you doing? How's it going, everyone? Yeah, perfect. So before we get to our guests, I want to send it over to our videos for Show Us What You Got. This week, we've got Raina from Geo8 Copa, who has sent in pretty nifty little trick into a shot. Yeah. Yeah. And Roman from BO6 Samba, who's showing us a little bit of uh, soccer slash golf uh, trick shots. Katie, first uh, question for you. So you're out yeah. at Washington University, St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your your time at Seattle United. Uh, you know what was most impactful for you, and okay. uh, and how that kind of led you on the path that you're on. Yeah. So I started with Seattle United. I think when I was 11 or 12, actually when the club started. So yep. um, and then I played with them through my junior year of high school. So I had a long time with the club. And um, I would definitely say like the part that stuck with me the most has just been um, like the community of the club um, and like the parents, the coaches, the players, all of that. Um, one of the coolest parts about joining the club um, when it was like just starting up is that I really got to kind of see firsthand how the culture grew um, and like kind of got to feel like I was a part of that um, yeah. like process. Um, so uh, like for me, at least I was on G98 Copa um, the entire time I was on the club and it was really awesome because a lot of the like core group of players um, we were able to like retain throughout the however many six, seven, eight years that I was on the team. Um, so I got to like form a lot of really impactful friendships there um, and just like get advice from different people all the time. Um, and then um, and more than just players, also like the coaches had a really big impact on me. Um, I know I had George saying, I don't know if he's still coaching or what his role he's is. Still around. Um, he's, he's still, still around. around. Amazing. Yeah, limping, um, yeah, limping he, around. <laughs> yeah, he was my first like big club coach that I had. And um, a lot of his advice is like still just it's like I can see how it shaped me um, to be the person I am today. Um, and like not even just like the coaches that I had, but like one of the cool things is that um, even coaches that I didn't miss necessarily like ever directly play under would sometimes sure. just like swing by practice and just like impart like little nuggets of wisdom on us or just like make us laugh and um just like there was a real sense of community amongst uh, the players and the coaches and then of course none of it would have been possible without um the parents who shuttle us to and from practice or um in the early days were like organizing practices and like managing the schedule for the team or filming team for um people to get recruitment videos all set up so yeah, I would say the just the community has been like the biggest part for me. And I think that's kind of like shaped um, what I prioritize now as a college player. Just um, like I knew going into the recruitment process that like team culture and like athletic community as well as team community was really big yeah. for me. Um, so I was kind of able to like hone in on specific schools because of like how Seattle United just like excelled in that area. Yeah. 
So what, what's some, some advice that you would give to some of these young female players that we have in the club right now? Um, I would say probably my biggest piece of advice is to just be confident in yourself. I think especially like as a young or like adolescent girl in a really competitive environment, it's really easy to like engage in negative self-talk and take sure. moments of coaching and turn them into moments of criticism. Um, like I know I was definitely guilty of that when I was younger. Like I would get really frustrated when I would get feedback um, and use it as a reason to like think that maybe I shouldn't be on the team that I was on or things like that. Um, yeah. But then I like kind of had to learn to reframe those moments and see them as a positive thing because it means that your coach or your teammates like see an opportunity for growth in you. And like at the end of the day, that's the most important thing is that you just continue to improve and get better and like stay open-minded and like stay humble. Um, so that would be like my, probably my biggest advice, especially to like young girl players. Um, I would also say like, just personally, like don't lose track of your passion or like your reason for playing soccer. Um, yeah. For me, it's always been my teammates. Um, for other people, it's sometimes just as simple as like love of the game. Some people just love competing, but just make sure that you're having fun and you're um, like doing it for a good reason. And like that at the end of the day, that's the most important part for me. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. So Jimmy and I were talking before the episode started, and um, I, I got to say probably the, the one thing, not the one thing, but one of the biggest things we're most proud of with, with yourself and, and Paul and Ethan as well and, and all the players that come through the program is how well academically most of them do as well. And uh, I saw that you were named an academic All-American, uh, yeah. so congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Question I have, and and Jimmy, you can jump on this as well, is what is your time management like, right? You're playing oh, yeah. NCAA soccer. You're you're obviously doing very, very well in school to be an academic All-American. How do you find that balance between soccer and education? Because that's most important at the end of the day. Yeah, um, I think, honestly, it kind of goes back to that idea of culture and community for me. Like, um, my coach made it, my college coach made it very clear coming in that the priorities on our team. So I play for a division three team. So it might be different for division one, but I think generally it's pretty aligned as it goes. School is number one, soccer is number two, and then social life is number three. Um, so I've always had that mindset that like at the end of the day, like school is like what's most important for me. And so I really take steps to prioritize that. Um, but I love to get out on the field and like compete and play with my like best friends. So um, just like finding a way to balance those is really important. And I think that being um, with the group of girls that I am has really helped me in that area because there's like such a culture of support on our team. I came in as a freshman, not really knowing what I wanted to study and not maybe having like the best goals for myself. I just kind of came in as like, just kind of like showing up, you know, like seeing, <laughs> trying to get this an idea of what the, yeah. what the feel was. Um, and so I think like my teammates made it pretty clear early on that like we are a team that like strives to do as well as we can academically. Um, and so just having that culture instilled um, in me pretty early on definitely helped. And then as far as time management, I mean, it's like, there's no perfect recipe to it. For me personally, I just try and like take advantage of those maybe like like awkward gaps in my day you know sometimes you'll have a weird like hour and a half break between classes and it's really easy to just go and like hang out with your friends and chat and like sometimes that's important sometimes you need a break but other times um that can be a really productive time for me so just kind of trying to find a way to balance it and then during season especially um kind of building spaces for yourself so on travel trips we always kind of take over the hotel lobby I think <laughs> maybe not the best thing but like there's always a table of Wash U and soccer players studying um and pe some people study in their rooms just kind of trying to figure out a way to like um still get like a good social experience in but like get what's important done yeah yeah sure and Paul, you you played Division One soccer at Georgetown, obviously a fantastic school. Um, you guys went all the way and and played in the national championship game, won the national championship game. So your season got extended even further than than some of the other players. How did you and how do you continue to manage that time between playing 
and studying and and still getting in that social part of your your uh, day yeah i think the most critical part for me is maintaining a really good relationship with my teachers um yeah. and I think it really paid off for me especially when we uh, went so late in the season because they were able to be really accommodating with me and um, really helped me out with the material that I was missing. Um, and I also think Katie made a really good point. You've got to find ways to just find little times where you can get 30 minutes of work done. So for me, I always tried every bus trip, I tried to get an hour of work done. And that is that pays dividends eventually. You know, you can get a lecture or two in by doing that or um, a big homework assignment that you might forget about. So that's what I did. Um, I have a fairly busy schedule too because I'm, I also work as a barista. So <laughs> All <laughs> right. As a, as a barista too. So I've got to be really good with my time. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. you know, let me cut in here. I yeah. always felt that um, – Paul would run for some kind of political office and possibly be Absolutely. president of the United States one day. I remember Katie. I'd vote for you, Paul. Kid. I remember Katie when she was a little kid, how competitive, and Ethan's the same thing. I think what I could say about these three players we have on today, and the interesting thing is I would think they're as competitive in the classroom as they are on the field. And I think that's where, you know, that's going to set up your long term future. And, you know, I had a gentleman one time tell me that if he could hire, high level athletes that have put in the commitment done the work on the field done the work in the classroom that they're always competitive and that yeah. you know they know how to compete and these three individuals uh are are some of the top competitors that clubs ever produced yeah uh, ethan you're still in high school right now and um you know that presents its own challenges with playing mm -hmm. for the sounders academy uh you just recently went to the u17 world cup uh in europe which obviously takes you out of school for a while. You've got to go to a training camp and whatnot with the national team. How do you find that balance between playing at such a high level like you do and finding time for your schoolwork, finding time for, you know, social life? I think it's a lot of just being willy, willing to put in the work and, you know, like on flights and stuff, I'm, a lot of times when I have homework to catch up on, I'll do it on flights and then, a lot of what um, Katie and Paul both talked about with having a good relationship with your teachers, that really helps a lot because a lot of my teachers have been super understanding and just communicating ahead of time when I'm going to leave for a trip and miss a good amount of school. Uh -huh. And they're able to work with me so that I can do some when I'm gone and also be able to extend some deadlines and work something out for when I get back. Yeah, perfect. Paul, tell us a little bit about your uh, journey there at Georgetown to the national championship. How was that for you? Low box defending type two. Back the box it comes. Oh, it's a chance for Rothrock. Georgetown has tied it up. They're right back in it. So uh, it's a crazy year for me. I um, the year anniversary of when I transferred schools um, was actually the national championship. So um, I'll explain my background quickly. But I started out at Notre Dame for a year and a half um, and. I wouldn't say I was unhappy there, but I, I definitely struggled. I didn't play my freshman year, and um, about halfway through my sophomore year, I picked up a bad knee injury. And I was realizing I'd, I wanted more balance in my life, and I wanted a, kind of a more diverse experience. Um, and I my, my coach retired that first recruited me, and um, uh, the – soccer that we were playing didn't really suit my style and I decided to transfer and uh, Georgetown actually first saw me as a right back which is kind of funny wow uh, yeah I don't think that I've never that said that <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and uh, yeah then a year later um, we ended up winning the whole thing but um, I think the thing I didn't realize was how many people would rally behind you as as the run started to build, and um, yeah. that was really special to see. You know, we had I had so many people from the club sending me text messages, and from my school and um, family friends who I hadn't talked to in years. So that was really special for me. Um, when and when you played for us, you played on a, a pretty special team. You guys were national runners up one year, national semifinalists the next year. You won Dallas Cup, which was you know obviously a huge accomplishment. 
tell us about your time with with Seattle United and and uh, do you connect still with some of those players that you played with? Yeah, I ha- my fondest memories are at Seattle United, and I I was one of the first kids to start there too, um, and I was extremely lucky with the mentors I had. You know, I look back at all of the mentors I had. I had the two of you. I had. Um, old Tommy Jenkins, I had <laughs> Brandon Cardo, uh, Jason Farrell, um, even guys who haven't coached me have been great mentors for me, like Carlos Enriquez and Alex yeah. Trist. Um, and then I think what made CIA United so special is that the scholarship program that the club has really allowed my team to become really special. Um, we had nine kids on scholarship on my team and the the more kids we got on scholarship ultimately correlated to our team being better and um we as soon as that started happening we started winning big games and playing in bigger tournaments and the only way that we could um fly and travel to those tournaments is if we raise money as a team so we would um we clean the whole UW stadium before all the UW football games, all 60,000 seats. And uh, we we did taco stands and raffles. And I think what that made me realize, too, is just to not take anything for granted. And um, so I, I feel extremely lucky about my time at CIA United and um, played in some really big games, which I think set me up for um, later on down the road. But, yeah. Only, only good memories. That, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, Polly was obviously, uh, you know, played in national finals in his youth career, um, very good academically, gone to a great high school, picked a college, and things change sometimes. You know, the coach moves on. I think it was Jamie's dad at the UW uh, was your yeah. first coach. Coaches move on, and sometimes it's just real important that we look at the schools we're going to, the style of play. How does it fit, fit academically like like Katie's talking about? I'm sure being an academic All-American, she's enjoying the Washington University. So it's very important. And I, I, I think that sometimes you get in a situation that doesn't work and you look to move like Pauly did. And not only did he play in the national final, he scored a goal in the national final. So it's it's just awesome to see that sometimes you you, you make decisions and it doesn't quite work out for you. And people that are highly competitive people and successful people move on and make it work elsewhere. And I think that's really great that you can go from a club like Notre Dame and go to Georgetown and win a national championship. And Katie can compete at Washington University and be an academic All-American. All these yeah. things are huge. And Ethan is just on the cusp, obviously, of looking what he wants to do with his career. Very successful. I spent time in Holland with Ethan when he was little, when his mom was calling me all the time <laughs> to make sure he was okay. But, uh, you know, he's got all this to look forward to, as as do many of our players. And it's just awesome yeah. to have these kind of – to be around these kind of kids, you know? Yeah, Ethan, you started in the club at a at a very young age. You started when you were eight uh, playing on our U10 team. I believe it was the second year of the club. Um, tell us about your time at Seattle United. You know, you played there until you were U14, I believe, and then moved on to the Sounders Academy. and and bigger and better things with the national team and whatnot. But uh, tell us about your time. What's been impactful for you? What do you remember about your time and, and what has helped you become the player that you are today? I think just working with the with the coaches and all the great advice I get, I, I started playing up a year and there was a time when it started to be better for me to move down and just being able to talk to you guys about that. And yeah. I think it was a great move for me to come down and join Chersky's team and help me a lot. And, and then I had some great memories with Seattle United too. Like winning state cup was amazing and just making some really, really good bonds with a lot of players on that team. It's really cool. I still stay in touch with a lot of them. And, um, and then, you know, when we, U 14 year, when I tried out for Sounders, I, I wasn't completely ready. I did. I made the team and I was super excited, but I didn't know if I was completely ready to go. And so we were, we were able to work something out so that I could do, so that I could split time between the two teams and practice some sometimes with Sounders and go on some trips with them, but also be able to stay with Seattle United. I think that was really, really great for my development. It helped me to grow as a player a lot. Yeah. You know, you have a lot of interesting people on this, this uh, show here, Ethan, and most of us, if not all of us have ever played in the world cup. What was it like playing in Brazil in the U 17 world cup? It was, it was amazing. It was super cool. I was obviously really disappointed with how we did. I thought, 
our team our team was a lot better than we showed and a lot more talented but just to be able to go there and to see all the fans and you know it's it was like it was the real deal we were playing in stadiums and got little like passes when we walked in and all that and it was it was super it was super cool and then seeing other amazing players around the world i think was because most of the kids i was playing against were already professionals and a lot of the kids i was training with on that national team i think of the guys that went there was maybe three of us that weren't signed to professional contracts so to see not only how talented and learn from them on the field to see how they handled themselves off the field i think a lot of them were really mature in the way they prepared for games and you know making sure to treat their body after games and be ready i think there was a lot to take away from that and i think you know kyle real quick with these three athletes here like most of our players, they have great families. I know all yeah. their families, and, and they seem to make good decisions, which is really good. Um, I know Polly's mom and dad, Ethan's mom and dad for years. I know Ethan's little sister that still plays the game at yeah. a really good level, you know, so, and, and Katie's dad and, and all, they, they seem to make good decisions and have their heads on right. So that's, it's really fun to work around kids like this and see success. Yeah, and I, think, I think it goes without saying that, you know, Obviously, we're a youth soccer club, and and our charge is to develop players. But you know, seeing how successful each one of these uh, guys have been in terms of academics, I think is is fantastic. You know, an academic all American with Katie, uh, George, uh, Paul at Georgetown. You know, he's going to be a doctor or a lawyer or or the president, president of, the of the United States. States. Yeah. Exactly, United States. we'll all vote for you. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and Ethan's got so many options. It's, it's fantastic. You know, um, I think it, it definitely serves to notice that school is very important as well. Time management is, is very important with all the soccer, all the schooling, uh, you know, especially things right now kind of in flux with, with people doing online school and whatnot. It's very important to have that self-discipline like you would have on the field and the self-motivation that you'd have to work on your own with soccer to do the same with academics and, and everything else and really try to focus on those things. Um, question for, for any of you guys is what, what kind of advice would you give to the youngest players in this club that are looking to do what you guys have done? Uh, Katie, let's start with you. Um. I would just say focus on the little things and make sure you do the little things right. Um, like those habits that you build start at a young age. Um, and so just make sure that you have a good foundation. Um, and if you need to work on something, it doesn't need to be a huge time commitment. You know, you don't need to go out and block out two hours of your day to get better. You know, you can yeah. just go out on your front lawn if you have one. Like I have a tiny little front lawn out here and that's where I've been getting my touches during quarantine. Um, just like try to find a way to just squeeze it into your day. Um, just make habits, make good habits. Yeah. Hey, Kate. Uh, Polly, what about you? Hey, could, Kyle, can we go back? Can we just ask yeah. these guys this to Katie? What do yeah. you feel your best trait was as a, as a young youth player? What was the thing that made you different than other mm. players? I think um, I know. I think I know. <laughs> I want to see if you know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I mean, you, you, say that. You, you said that I was very competitive. I think that helped. Um, yeah. I think I also generally... I think I did a good job of like reading the field as a defender. You're at an advantage because you have the whole field in front of you normally. So um, the head on the swivel thing is important for everyone, but it's, you know, it's not as important as a defender. So I think I was pretty good at reading the field, um, but being just like, being competitive also is helpful. <laughs> but what yeah, I, th <laughs> do you I think you're right. You were very, very competitive and always eager to play. And that's what yeah. I always noticed besides the skill and the passing and everything else you're, your ability to compete was was yeah. very very high level, so yeah. it was fun watching. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, Jimmy. Uh, by the way, Katie did want me to uh, remind you that you still owe G ninety eight Copa ice cream. Yeah, and As, like I said, you owe many, town, many of the teams in the club <laughs> ice cream. Uh, break out the wallet. Uh, yeah, Paul, Don't worry, Paul, same question. I mean, what's some of the advice you'd give to to the youngest players, and and what do you feel like your biggest attribute was as a player 
Yeah, I think um, for the young players, my best advice to give you would be to uh, maintain a balanced lifestyle. And I think it's hard these days because everyone's so focused on starting from such a young age and there's very few athletes who are playing multiple sports now, but play, no. play basketball if you still want basketball. And if you're into some sort of dancing, do dancing. I did uh, tap dancing for three years when I was... Wow, Polly. I did not know seven. that. And I feel like it ended up helping me in some way. You know, if you like a musical instrument, keep doing that. And um, I think... There's such a, a long road ahead in terms of your soccer career. And if you don't maintain a balanced lifestyle, you'll burn out. And you see numerous guys in college who that happens to, where they yeah. get to college and all of a sudden it's the whole part of your life is school and soccer. And if you don't maintain a balance there, it becomes really, really overwhelming. So um, I would say that. And then my other piece of advice would be, See if you can just do 20 minutes of extra work that no one else is doing. So if you're uh, – what I do at Georgetown is I go out 30 minutes before everybody else, and that just guarantees me that I'll have a good day of training because, number one, I know I've gotten better at something, and number two, I know that I'm I'm ready to go as soon as training starts. And if you continue to do that consistently and consistently, it will pay off for you. Um, and then I would say – What's your biggest attribute? You were always very good with your feet, so I bet that tap dancing helped. <laughs> now it makes sense. Now it makes sense. Uh, I would say I I loved playing in the big games. Uh, and when I when I trained by myself, I used to just visualize being in the State Cup final or the no, Dallas no. Cup final or something. And... Um, what ended up happening for me is those ended up being some of my best games. And um, if I look back on my youth career, I, I probably think of that. Um, I also had a lot of fun. And I think when you show how much fun you're having and you play with a lot of joy, it's a infectious thing for um, teams. Um, so that's what I would say. You know. Kyle, Paul, Paul he was always very technically gifted. And I, I think uh, he understates his ability and uh, he's a great salesman. I mean, if anything happened on the team, Paul <laughs> could always talk their way out of what was going on. He, he, he could. He could. He never want to see, but boy, he was a leader, a captain, and uh, you know, future president of the United States. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I remember a couple stories. One being in uh, Santa Clara that that I'll I'll mention to you privately, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Ethan, how about you? What I mean, you are extremely technically gifted as well and, and um, very smart player. What, what, are, what would you say is one of your biggest attributes and what would you tell young players that are playing in the club right now to uh, focus on? Um, for young players, I would say one of the most important things, and this was really vital to my career and my time at Seattle United, was just being willing to learn and your resilience because I think Seattle United does a great job of putting you in situations that you might be uncomfortable in, especially through younger ages. You're going to play against people that are better than you and you're going to be in situations like me going to state cup i know before seattle united i'd never been on that big of a stage and then regionals and it's pushing you outside of your comfort zone so just how you're how you're willing to learn from that and how you're willing to rise up to the challenge and take the advice from your coaches and being resilient and then yeah for me for me i would just say probably just my versatility i and being able to adapt playing different positions within the club I know I was I was a wide midfielder for most of my time with um with Nate and with you and then when I went to play with Chersky I was in a different role as a striker and yeah. just being able to take stuff from the coaches and definitely um game IQ on the field checking your shoulder and all that I took that really that was really important to me in my game, in my game. Yeah, and again, when you when you look at Ethan, he was always always technically gifted, always very skillful. I went to Holland with him. We were in Ajax. The Ajax coaches loved him when we went there. In terms of, I think he was thirteen, fourteen, and you know they were very very impressed. Uh, very very good vision. 
good passing as long as he stays off of motorcycles like his dad and doesn't fall <laughs> off. Because I know his old man like like uh, motorcycles. So he just you know when you got that kind of skill, you don't want to be wasting it on a motorcycle and crashing. So. But anyway, yeah, I, always think, I think player. your mom will keep you in check. Yeah, yeah, yeah she she will. Will. <laughs> but, but fantastic player. All these kids were, were fantastic in their own way and great personalities and uh, just overall great kids. So just an honor yes. to work with them. Well, Katie, Paul, Ethan, thanks so much for being on the episode this week. Uh, thanks for sharing your experiences and, and your advice for, for young players. Uh, kids, if you have any questions for Jimmy and I that you'd like us to answer on the show send a video asking the question and uh we'll put it up on the episode and, and answer it as best we can when irish people turn 60 like me they have to go to a senility test and little ethan and alex went up for their senility test and ethan went first and the doctor says answer me a question Ethan or or alex or whatever he says what would happen to you if i stuck a stick in your eye he says, oh, talk to her. That would really hurt and I wouldn't be able to see. And he says, well, what would happen if I took the stick out of one eye and stuck it in the other eye? He says, oh, doctor, I'd be totally blind. I wouldn't be able to see a thing. So he says, very good. You're not seen. Oh, out the door you go. And Alex was walking. He says, Alex, say partially and totally blind and you'll be just fine. So Alex walks in there and the doctor says, tell me, Alex. He says, you have a senility test here. What would happen if I cut off your left ear? He says, oh, man, doctor, I'd be partially blind. I wouldn't be able to see. He says, oh, man. He says, tell me this, what would happen if I cut off your other ear? He says, oh, doctor, he says, I'd be totally blind. I wouldn't be able to see a thing. And the doctor says, well, he says, this is not good. You're going to have to tell us your answer. He says, well, doctor, the way I got it sussed out, if you cut off both my ears, there'll be nothing to hold up my glasses, and I wouldn't be able to see a bloody thing. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. Hey, Thanks. Hey, Kyle. Hey. I yep. want to talk about just a real, real quick. Yep. Um, everybody, stay safe, safe out there. Make sure we're following the, the rules of the governor. I mean, I, I just wanted to say that we're very, very lucky. My family and all my grandkids and so on and so forth are safe and sick. I hope that for everybody. I know it's a tough time. Um, we have families that have sick people in their family or friends. I think we just have to hang in there and be positive. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm. I'm, I feel for kids like Ethan and Kate, uh, Katie and Pauly that can't go out and play right now. No. I know playing part of your 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 DNA and part of your life will get through this. But um, I think we just all have to be safe. And uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to work with kids like this because uh, you're really pushing forward to the next generation. Yeah, for sure.